Hi, Sean. Hi, Glenn. Hello. Hello. How is everyone this evening? Good. Well. Hello, Sean. It's Esther Bigler. How Hi. are you? I'm good. Nice to see your face, Esther. How are you? Nice to see your face. Maybe someday we'll actually get to meet and together, you know? Well, I've got just the time. You should, you should come to Community Board 14's um, reception on June 21st. I'll, I'll send you a, an actual the, the flyer invite so that you have it in your inbox. Oh, terrific. Thank you very much. It'd be great to see you there. And if not, we'll figure something out. Okay, good. Hi, doing? It's Naomi. Hey, Naomi. How you doing? Thank God. Thank oh, God. Good. 
Um, Ed, I see one representative from um, Janae Malloy from DOT is with us, but the other presenters aren't on yet. And I'm happy to give it a few minutes. I understand Steve may be experiencing some child care issues, but okay. I understand that he will be joining us the last he, um, when he last communicated with me. But okay. I, yeah, well, I, I take it off when the rest of the DO team, DOT team is here. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and Diana's here. Hi, Miss you. Hello, Sorry. everyone. Hi, Diana. Hello. Um, Sean, so I see our first set of presenters. Um, I'm happy to kick us off uh, if you want to. Yeah, give me one second. Sure. Good to go. All right, great. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to CB14's Transportation Committee meeting on uh, June 6th, uh, starting at 6.31. Uh, my name is Ed Sen, and I'm the Transportation uh, Committee co-chair. And we have two agenda items um, that uh, we're discussing tonight. Um, two presentations from DOT, our first being updates on city bike station expansion uh, in Community District 14. And uh, the second being bike lane network proposals in us, uh, Community District 14. So um, I believe our first presenters are here, um, Ms. Malloy and Ms. Marasco. Um, Happy to share the floor. And oh, I see that my co chair is also here, Steve. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Tell me if you need, if you can share your screen if that's what you're planning to do, or if I need to make you the presenter. Yeah, let me try to share real quick, see if that works. Okay, does Good. everyone see the presentation? Perfect. Um, so, yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Janae Malloy, and I'm here with my colleague Lisa Marasco, and we're here to give an update on the um, city bike updated plan uh, for expansion into CB14. So, uh, tonight's presentation um, is pretty much going to be very similar to the one that was given back in March, I believe. Um, the only difference tonight is that when we get to the end to actually uh, take a look. At the maps, um, I'll walk through some of the changes that have been made since that last presentation. Um, so, yeah, that'll go ahead and get started. And then, of course, at the end, we'll open it up for questions, of course. Um, but just revisiting, uh, you know, the overview of the program. Um, 
city bike, you know, is intended for point to point transportation or basically just providing another option uh, for people in uh, CB 14 to get around. Um, and it's a great option uh, to also connect to existing transit that's in the area. This allows for people to, you know, have access to a bike without having to own one. Um, and the uh, city bike in general is a partnership between DOT and Lyft. So us at DOT, we handle all of the planning and the outreach and Lyft is responsible for um, all of the maintenance and managing the equipment. Um, also, the bike share stations are uh, not hardwired into the ground and they operate simply off of solar powered um, and just, you know, as mentioned, it's a station based bike share system. So this is not dockless. Uh, City bike, we just recently celebrated 10 years uh, in New York. So we started back in 2013 in Manhattan and Brooklyn um, with phase one, phase two, we expanded further into Manhattan, uh, Brooklyn and Queens. And then phase three, that's the phase that we're in now where we've gone um, through the rest of Manhattan, further into Brooklyn, Queens, and as well as the Bronx. Um, and doubling our uh, the amount of bikes in our service area. And so an updated look at some of our ridership. Um, we have a little over 181 million trips to date. That's about 100,000 daily trips in peak riding months, which typically tend to be, you know, spring, summer, fall. Um, we also have about 182,000 annual members um, and about 10,000 of those members are reduced fare bike share members. So, speaking of reduced fare and just our membership in general, um, a review of our pricing structure. So, a single ride, um, this is just, you know, if you're checking out a bike, you don't necessarily have a membership, is $449. Um, we also offer a day pass for $19. And then um, the annual membership, uh, the most popular one for residents, uh, is those that um, is for $205 a year or uh, $17 a month. And then speaking of that reduced fare uh, bike share program, um, this is offered to NYSHA residents and SNAP recipients who can sign up for membership, city bike membership for just $5 a month and they're not locked into an annual commitment. And then we also have community credit, credit union members um, like the Brooklyn Co-op who offer a discount code to get um, the, the city bike membership for $5 a month as well. That one is with an annual commitment. So, in addition to the reduced fare bike share, there's also our community grants program, who um, sets up opportunities to provide partner keys and free ride codes to unlock bikes for different uh, groups promoting uh, safe cycling in the city or to just help people get out on the bikes. And uh, for safety, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen, um, but since we are wrapping up like bike month, that was in May, and just since the weather is warmer, DOT has had um, different groups go out and table in different areas around the city, passing out um, safety equipment like helmets, lights, and bells. And they're also conduct conducting uh, safety awareness classes as well. Um, we also have projects um, being rolled out from our green 2019 Green Wave plan, um, focusing on building out more bicycle infrastructure so that people feel safe when they're out riding. Um, and then again, just uh, as a reminder that uh, all city bike kiosks and bicycles have rules of the road posted on them. And so the picture on the bottom is just an example of that in one of our city bike uh, baskets. Okay, and then we'll uh, review the our planning process, <clears throat> which is broken down in these four steps. And so first one being our station siting. So um, back in the beginning stages of the planning process, um, we basically focused on creating a dense network of stations across the area we were considering, in this case, CD14. Um, and the idea here is that we want to provide equal access to the stations across the service area. So in order to do that, um, we plan in such a way that uh, a user would be no more than a three to five minute walk to their nearest station. So let's say you go to find a bike and it's not there, there's none available at your closest one, then you're super close to the next best option um, nearby at another docking station, or if you're looking to dock a bike um, and there's no available docks, you're not too far from the next option over. Um, so that's kind of the idea that we have when we're planning these out. 
Um, and then, of course, once we look at specific locations, we have to make sure we're not blocking any hydrants or utilities and making sure we're maintaining um, enough width for uh, ADA accessibility and pedestrian flows as well. Oh, sorry. Okay, so taking a look at uh, public outreach, um, our outreach was done in several different ways. So first we had our uh, in-person outreach with the DOT street ambassadors who went out to try to collect feedback on where people would like to see stations. Um, we also had uh, an interactive feedback portal uh, that was posted online for people to uh, drop a pin to show where they wanted to see a station and maybe where they didn't think it was a great idea to put a station. Um, and then we also conducted uh, virtual stakeholder meetings um, to collect additional feedback as well. And then, so when we did, when we had this uh, online feedback portal, uh, we, we had it for uh, both 14 and 17 um, open that people could uh, drop pins for. And so we, for that area, we received about like 600, over 600 total comments collected. And then, so once we uh, collected that feedback, um, that's when we start getting into the draft plan creation. Um, so we're taking that feedback, overlaying it on a map, um, factoring in our siting principles and guidelines, and then Lyft has their own operational consideration based off of like what their equipment can handle. Um, and uh, so some of the feedback, you know, that we saw for CV 14 was, um, a lot of people, a lot of the cluster feedback was uh, around subway stations. A lot of people really wanted access to all the, the subway stations in the area, um, obviously <clears throat> getting close to the park. Um, and then there was a lot of uh, feedback for um, request along Cortell U. Um, so that's just a sneak peek of some of the things that we saw with, with the feedback that we received. Um, so yeah, and then we uh, presented our draft plan to you all, I believe back in March. Um, and then posted a, a copy of that draft plan online. And so after we had posted that draft plan, we moved on into our, um, we allowed for a month uh, to receive any additional feedback from you all or uh, members of the community um, before, before moving on into our technical screening and coordination stage, um, which is basically where we start looking into um, the design of the stations and, and placement. Um, after that, moving into um, beginning to reach out to adjacent property owners to notify them of the locations uh, where we were planning to place a station. Um, and then once we notify all the adjacent property owners, uh, we will begin with installing these stations um, after everyone has been notified. And then once the stations are on the ground, we'll continue to do outreach and then monitor the station stations and make uh, any adjustments um, that are necessary. Okay, so that was a review of our process um, and now we'll just go ahead and take a look at the updated plan. So this is just an overview of the updated plan for CB14. Um, we're going to, similar to last time, zoom in and take a look at the uh, proposed locations and then I'll walk through some of the changes that have been made since the uh, draft plan was presented. I just wanted to uh, take time to here to mention that the updated plan map, this map that I'm showing here is available online at nyc.gov slash bike share um, for everyone to review, uh, especially if you need a, a closer look uh, that is available online. So in the next slides, I'll go through, take a closer look at the locations. So on this slide, this is the northernmost portion of the map. Um, and again, so, the orange icons are going to be the proposed locations for where we plan to place a station. Um, the triangles represent the sidewalk locations and these uh, squares represent the roadbed locations. Um, the letters that you see on those orange icons are just indicating which side of the road it's on. So this one that I'm hovering over here is a, a sidewalk location um, on the north side of the street. And so just to call out here, some of the changes from the uh, draft plan when we um, originally presented uh, where we had these two stations up here along Parkside Avenue that were still pending coordination with the Prospect Park Alliance and, um, and Parks Department just to coordinate with them to see if this would be viable. 
they said yes. And so we are just confirming that these two um, were okay and that we plan to place them along Parkside at these two locations here. So that's what these little, these circled icons are indicating that these were a change from before. And then I'll go into the next section. So this is the southern portion of the map. And sorry, I gotta move my little thing because I'm like blocking the sites on my screen. Okay. Um, so here we have a few changes that I'll I'll go over. Um so starting with some of the feedback that we received uh, from the draft plan were um just some concerns about how this would um how how this would overlap with any changes uh coming up with the Brooklyn bus redesign and maybe like you know future bus stops along Beverly Road um with that project. And so uh we looked into shifting some of the stations that were originally uh plan for on Beverly to shift just off of Beverly, not to conflict with any of the routes or the stops that might be planned along uh, along that path. And so what you see right here in this uh, lighter shade of orange, this was originally what we presented, um, but we have now shifted to this site uh, down to Matthews Court. So it's no longer on Beverly. And then same with this one here, this was uh, originally on Beverly and we shipped it over to rugby. Um, so this is right adjacent to the existing bike lane that's here. Another um, point of feedback that we received uh, was to add capacity along Cortell U Road. Originally, we presented um, these three here at the bottom, um, but we found um, more space over here on Cortell U and East 19th Street. So we were able to add one more station to add capacity on court, tell you to accommodate the feedback that we received. And then one last uh, change over here, if you see where my cursor is. Um, so this was originally planned as a roadbed station here uh, on the west side of Bedford Avenue and Beverly Road. Um, after uh, completing our survey and taking a look at that, another look at the site, we uh, realized that we had space uh, to shift the station onto the sidewalk and essentially restore parking there. So that is what this change is showing is that this uh, station went from a roadbed to a sidewalk uh, site. And so uh, with that, that's pretty much all of the updates that we had. Um, from the original draft plan that we presented and happy to open it up for any questions um, and revisit any slides uh, that you would like to see again. Uh, thank you for that presentation, Ms. Malloy. Uh, before we go into q and I'd like to acknowledge uh, the uh, electeds and, and the representatives in the room. So um, I'd like to give council member Yeager the floor if should he want to address this assembly. No, I, th I appreciate it. I'm going to wait for the next part of the presentation. Uh, none of these docking stations are in my district, and I don't want to step on the toes of any of my colleagues, uh, regardless of what I might think about the wisdom of putting these where they are. It's certainly a neighborhood I know very well. I was a member of this board for 18 years before I was elected to the council, um, but I'll let my colleagues who represent that area opine on whether or not DOT knows what it's doing. Most who have followed me know that I know DOT doesn't know what it's doing. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, from Assembly, Assembly Member uh, Robert Carroll's office, we have Mary uh, K. Siri in the room as well. Uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, Chair Emeritus Alvin Burke uh, and uh, also uh, Officer Joseph from the Seminole. Um, and Sean, uh, is there anyone else I may be missing on this list? Um, Anastasia Yazkova from the Mayor's Community Affairs Unit, who's been dealing with me all day. Um, thank you for being here, too. Uh, got it. My apologies. Um, all right. Uh, with that out of the way, um, yeah, I'm happy to uh, move on to the Q&A portion of this presentation. Um, Hi. Uh, 
I, I would like to raise a point um, for part um, of I think the we're waiting for the co-chairs to call on people, Mr. Brown. We will put you on the list as raising your having raised your hand. But the order Perfect. I saw the hands go up in were Esther Bigler, then Liz Denise, then Ben Turndorf. I think we'll start with board members first. That, that's our usual um, protocol. So I guess Liz, if you want to uh, go 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 first, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to first thank DOT for putting so much thought into um, taking our previous feedback into account. Um, this looks like a really comprehensive network in the area, um, the area that of our district that is being considered. Um, and I just wanted to ask what the rollout was going to be. Like, what when should we expect to see these docs live? Yeah, so uh, install is set to begin uh, this summer. So, like, uh, towards the end of this month or beginning of July, because we're in June now. Um, yeah, and it'll take uh, through July as well. So, it'll be this summer. Um, as far as other board members' hands, I see Nina. <laughs> Ah, hold on, sorry. Um, a little slow here. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, my, I guess my big question is, are there plans to continue moving further south? I mean, I think that, you know, what's going on here is really great, but as somebody who lives south of Cortelio Road and has nothing within walking distance and almost having my bike stolen today at work, uh, and I work at two locations where there are um, where there are city bikes, but it doesn't, you know, help when you're still, you know, a two mile walk to the closest uh, bike share. So I'm just wondering what whether there are future plans, what those might look like. Uh, yeah, so we don't. It won't be in this rollout, obviously, but um, that we're presenting tonight. But yeah. I think talks are still going on about what the next phases will look like in the future. Um, so it's kind of just let's stay tuned until uh, that those plans start to develop. Um, but we're happy to hear that people do want the, this to expand further. Be our game, huh? Feedback to receive. So um, yeah, we'll just have to keep you all updated as those plans develop. But there I am. It just seems I like Avenue H are such obvious easy places where there's lots of room. Um, and it meets all of the criteria that you've brought up in terms of not interfering with accessibility or anything for that matter. So I don't know the cost part of it, but what I'd say, Nina, is if you want more city bike further south, the best thing to do is write in um, so that we have like a formal request. Um, I, I, I did put that on the, you know, I guess I'll just keep hammering away. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we also have a question in the chat from Musa Hassoun. Um, what is the table on the rollout? Yeah, so that's going to be the, the Before summer. you answer, I'm sorry. Could everybody, I'm chasing you all all over the screen to mute, mute you all. If you could please mute yourselves. Um, unless you're speaking, that would be really helpful for the feedback and sound quality. Thank you. Sorry, Janae, go ahead. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, so the rollout will be this summer towards the end of the month, taking us through the rest of July, and that's going to be for uh, across CB14 and 17 as well. Thank you. Um, I'm just trying to catch up uh, with the hands. So, board member uh, Florencia Chang Ajeda. Yes, good evening. I'm just, uh, I noticed today I was driving on the block and it's a residential block, but there was ducking there. So, I'm like, as a as someone who drives like and I, and I appreciate bikes because family members of mine ride however are we going to how much parking space will we be utilizing or displacing yeah that's or, a am i the only one concerned about that Can you watch carter cc uh, just um 
Okay, yeah, so uh, to address your question, so we have what was presented tonight was a total of 21 um, stations, and so 11 of those are going to be on the side. Did I say that? I didn't hear that. Sorry, sorry, Steve Cohen, I think you're unmuted. Um, yeah, so today what we presented to you were a total of 21 stations, 11 of those are on the sidewalks, obviously that will impact parking. Uh, 10 of those were placed in the roadbed. Um, the roadbed stations, you know, we tried to do our best to put them near the spots that made the most sense, like the subways and like, you know, the parts and, and areas where people want them the most, but will likely on average, depending on the station size, they can take up to 2 to 3 parking spaces at those locations. But we try to do our best to, you know, select all, as many of the sidewalk locations that we could that were available based on the criteria that I went over. Um, Early in the presentation, uh, but yeah, it's something that we are aware of for each of the community boards that we go into. Okay, thank you. And a uh, board member, uh, Naomi Lipnick. Yes, I'm. I know bicycles are very, very good, and everyone likes the exercise. But I'm talking as a car driver. They go in and out of traffic. They don't stop for red lights. And it's really dangerous when you're driving and you don't see them coming. So something has to be done either with the police department or the Department of Transportation that they have to they have to accept the, the traffic lights. And when it's a red light, they have to stop and not go right through. And most of them do not do it. They're not they're not courtesy to the they're not courteous to the car drivers, and they want car drivers to be courtesy to the bike guys. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Medi Harris. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I appreciate it. And um, as a person who bikes a lot and doesn't drive, I think um, this plan improves the um, bikeability in, in this neighborhood. And I appreciate that. And in fact, um, again, I think um, uh, we should not um, assume that sidewalk um, area should be taken for parking uh, for basically city bike and not parking lots. Um, so I think um, they are both um, space for city and we can utilize those spaces. So I'm not, um, I don't in principle have any problem with taking parking lots for that. <clears throat> also, um, I see that there are uh, some um, stations on um, Beverly, but uh, we don't have a bike lane on Beverly. So I think uh, probably we need follow up plans um, to, you know, put bike lane on Beverly or slow down cars uh, to create a more safer environment for bikers. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your feedback. I think. Um... From what we collected previously, we tried to, you know, shift as many of the stations uh, that were on Beverly off, just off of it. So, on like the street that it intersected with, um, and I think the remainder is just, we have 1 remaining on Beverly, but I do agree with your point of, you know, increasing infrastructure so that people feel safe when they're riding along the streets in this area. So I believe that's all the members from the community board. I'm happy to turn it over to members of the public. So I'll just go in the order of the names that I see them. Uh, ben Turndorf. Hi, um, thanks so much to DOT for making the presentation. Um, uh, I live kind of on the northeast edge of this proposal. I'm very excited to see it. Um, I think it's gonna, um, be really great. I have a lot of friends that um, I think will be coming into that area more and um, go into the businesses there, which I think is great news for everyone. Also, to the comments around parking, uh, I actually have some friends who have recently gotten rid of cars because of bike share coming into their neighborhoods. Um, so it's not just hypothetical, it, it really happens. So i um, very excited about that. A question that I do have is, um, it was mentioned that uh, sharing feedback with DOT and writing is effective. What's the best form to do that in? Thank you. 
I think it depends on like your question. If it's specific to bike share, we have a bike share in like a email address that we can drop in the chat. Um, if you want to share something specifically about like city bike or bike share, any shared mobility um, in the city. But if it's um, specific to DOT, I think going through like the 311 channel is probably best or through the borough commissioner's office, we can also drop um, their phone number um, in the link as well. I'm sorry to jump in, but I might also suggest that you contact your local community board. We can pass on messages. Thank you. <laughs> uh, moving right along, uh, Daniel Feldman. Uh, hi, I just want to uh, hello everybody. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak. I want to thank the community board 14 for all the great work they do in the Department of Transportation. Um, I'm a city bike member. My kids are city bike members. We use city bike. I'm looking forward uh, to using city bike more. Um, I do have a few questions about why there are two stations, one block apart in an area of an incredibly low uh, population density. That's rugby road. Um, that in and of itself is a, certainly a concern of mine. I also want to just bring up, uh, and, and I would like to know what the thought was uh, behind two stations a couple of hundred feet apart in an incredibly low density area. But I also want to bring up a point of order, and that is that uh, one of the stations is is essentially outside my door. Um, and we have a very serious ponding and flooding issue during heavy rains already. Um, as it is, uh, particularly in the last few years, with some of the more significant rainfalls that we've had, we've had rain well up onto the curb, uh, onto the sidewalk, and onto the front of our house um, at, at, at various times. That also causes typically flooding uh, back into the house. We, in fact, during that huge rainstorm we had about two years ago, two and a half years ago, uh, we actually had flooding into our own house. Um, with a station on the downhill side, uh, uh, blocking access essentially, or at least impeding access to uh, for the rainwater to fall into the sewer system. Um, who do I send a bill to for the next cleanup that I have to do or the sinking of my front yard or my front step? Uh, because it's a major issue already and I'm very, very concerned about uh, uh, the amount of flooding that we're going to get as a result of, I don't know, 10, 15, 16, 18, um, essentially little barriers between uh, 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 my front, the front of our, our house here and the sewer system. Thank you. So I just dropped our bike share um, like email address. Um, like I have access to it. I can, anyone on our team can access it. Um, so we can like chat with you specifically about what's going on there to make sure that, you know, placing a station somewhere um, or an existing station doesn't exacerbate uh, a particular situation that you have. So happy to, you know, talk with you about your particular um, situation. Okay, yeah, we're we're at the Rugby Road in Beverly. We're uh, we're 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 adjacent to the Be Beverly Road and and Rugby Station. And and I will tell you that the last major rainstorm we had about two years ago, we had tens of thousands of dollars of damage to our house, and that was without those you know all of those little humps that that would impede the water flow. So um, um, I I really hope yeah. that you take a look because that is an issue in various parts of this of this general area of New York City. And I really hope that you take a look at that one again um, and that you take that into consideration as you move forward with your plans to expand. And I do hope you expand. I just hope you take that that flooding issue because those bikes will be a foot underwater for sure. Yeah, I mean, certainly like flooding and that those sort of issues are like top of mind for our operators. Um, obviously, they don't want their equipment to be sitting in water. Um, yeah. So certainly something we'll keep an eye out. Uh, for, but what I'd say is like, you know, generally like city bike stations, the way that we design them and configure them into the roadbed, um, we do leave you know, a bit of channeling so that like water can run. Obviously, serious rainstorms or areas that are like low lying have other issues, um, you know, going on. So we'll certainly take that feedback, especially for the Beverly and Rugby, um, keep our eye out and make sure to make any adjustment shifts. Uh, that we need to make um, with that new knowledge. But again, we have that email address, um, you know, we dropped happy to like open a conversation. Um, okay, I'm sorry, well. where, where did I get that email address again? I, I dropped it in the chat. You dropped it in the chat, okay, thank you very much.
Uh, up next, I believe we have uh, Lindsay. Sure. So I have a few questions about a few of the placement. Um, in your presentation, you talked about how we're, we're placing them where it's point transportation, also connect transportation. Um, the two on rugby seem a bit confusing to me because there's no des clear destination there. And there's also no existing transportation. So you're not connecting from a bike to the subway, perhaps. Um, and then my third. Okay, let me turn my camera on. I'm so sorry. Is that better? Yeah, I think so. Okay, I turned my camera off. Okay. Um, and then my third question is I think I think the goal of the program is to put it in places that are um serve the most people in terms of people without bikes. And I'm not sure our neighborhood is the correct one just because like, I think most of us own a bike because we have garages. Um, not saying I don't want it here. I'm just saying that in terms of like point to point transportation, I'm not sure it's the best use of our tax money. Okay, thank you, Lindsay. Um, I guess to start with, your first point. So yeah, I did mention that it's it's great for point to point, you know, trips and and connecting to existing transit. That is one of the benefits. Um, as I mentioned, you know, with trying to create that dense network is providing options. So um, not only placing them at at subway stations, not only placing them at parks, but so people can also get to other places as well. Even if that means you know, if they want to get back home. Like we have to have them in residential areas. If they want to get to the store, we have to have them in commercial areas. So there has to be some type of, um, we try to provide variety uh, so that people can not only reach those destinations, but they can also get back. So that's kind of how we plan out that spread there. Um, and just as far as just rolling out for those who may or may not have bicycles um, in the neighborhood, I hear you. Um, I, I think it's also a great option for those who do have personal bikes, just for the times when, let's say you don't want to pull out your, your bike from your uh, your courtyard in your building or your garage if you happen to have one and you just need to go do something real quick and don't want to pull out your bike or it looks like it's clear in the morning, but it's going to rain in the afternoon. You have that flexibility of not having to worry about, you know, tugging your own bike around if something to change throughout the day. So I think it, it helps to kind of offset that balance for those who even have personal bikes, but I do hear what you're saying. I guess my general question is, what was the strategy in picking those particular locations? Yeah, so you mentioned Rugby Road. Um, uh, I think, you know, just first off, it was looking at the spacing of between how we were selecting the stations within the area. I think that one also came up as a great opportunity just because it already has the infrastructure there with a, um, a designated bike lane along rugby. And that was called out in some of the feedback that we received in the portal was to place it along rugby because it already had a bike lane. So I think people just associated, there's already a bike lane here, here are bikes. They kind of put that, um, those kind of in the same camp. Uh, up next, we have Austin Brown, and I just want to acknowledge in the interest of time, that our last public speaker will be Mr. Murray Lantner, and then also I believe our district manager has uh, some questions and comments as well, and then we'll leave it at that and move on to the next presentation. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for your presentation and the information you've shared with us. Um, I represent a number of residents on the block between Beverly Road and Westminster, uh, and I was contacted by uh, Lyft. Uh, my property is going to be sort of adjacent to the proposed new site on the corner of Westminster and Beverly Road. Um, <clears throat> and I have a number of questions that, that we would like to ask and address. One is how that site in particular was selected. <clears throat> um, like the uh, some of my residents in the, in the nearby neighborhood, uh, Daniel Feltman, um, 
we questioned why that there was two locations so close to each other between Rugby Road and Westminster. On uh, Westminster, we don't have a cycle path. Uh, the site that has been located or chosen or proposed is actually we think is a dangerous location to look to have a bike because we haven't as you know Beverly Road is a fairly busy road we have quite a few trucks uh, coming down there these trucks often turn down onto Westminster to go down to Cortelu we've requested they install a, a ramp which they have done a, a bump if you like down the road however the location of the site is on a right hand corner so cars will be turning right and our concern is as we can see straight out the window I've noticed at least two crashes within the last 12 months. If someone is pulling a bike out, it's quite possible that those cars turning right would not see those bikes. Uh, so we, we have safety concerns that we would like noted and raised. Uh, the other thing we have uh, was being raised to me to, to ask the committee is around the, the cleaning and disposal of trash in each of the locations. Um, I've been told that City Bike uh, and the the, the uh, Department of Transport, they have designated contractors that clean the stations every 15 days. Um, I suppose the question on that is the residential streets at the moment are clean twice, twice a week on a Monday and a Thursday. Uh, now we're moving to a place where it's only going to be cl uh, cleared every 15 days. And there's a lot of concern. We do get a lot of trash that blows down Beverly Road and blows down Westminster Road and that will accumulate in those locations and not be cleared at a, uh, you know, in a, in a timely manner. Um, and then also to Mr. Feltman's point earlier, that the proposed location is very close to a storm drain that I personally have learned through painful experience that whenever it's about to rain, I need to make sure it's clear of trash and plastic um, or leaves and debris that just build up. Uh, otherwise, we do get flooding. Um, luckily for us, not onto our property because our property has a sort of wall just above, but all the way along the side uh, and round into the front onto to Be Beverly Road. So there was a, lot, uh, a bike location located there. There was heavy rain and we build up. Those bikes would be under a, you know, a foot of water at least. Um, and lastly, I suppose the point, uh, the last point I would make, like to make is just a question of the diagram that I received from uh, I think it was Lyft representations so uh, a young man in New Jersey contacted me to inform me that this had site had been located and he sent me a, a kind of Google map image shot of the, the, the location and it's it stands halfway along the block I'm not I questioned how many bikes are actually going to be installed in this location however that leaves another area for which you could possibly get a car or you know, a bike in. How is that area going to be cleaned? Who's responsible for cleaning up that that area? Um, and then there was concerns raised, and I, I'm sure you've you've had this before. Maybe you can uh, address these from your prior experience, where questions have been raised by re residents. But there was questions re raised around increased noise and foot traffic in the area um, that they didn't feel was needed this area given its low population density many people already own bikes and it is not near any uh, commercial area and the proposal was it should be moved down towards Cortalio. i just saw on your presentation that you already have um three locations on Cortalio, but the proposal was that the, the residents felt that a better consideration for a city bike location would be near a more commercial center where you had increased foot traffic and pedestrians that were more likely to be using that location. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I guess to one of your earlier points um, about just turning clearances uh, and like the extent of the station, um, we do send these out to review in our internal units to review uh, clearances on, on vehicles being able to turn once a station uh, a station footprint would be proposed on the ground there. So they review that before we're able to even move forward to see if vehicles can successfully turn at these intersections. Um, and we also allow some a bit of a buffer space on either end of the station and. and sorry, sorry, just a point. Sorry to interrupt you, but just to clarify. So it's not it's not a point of the cars being able to turn. The cars are going to be able to turn. 
it's people will be will taking bikes out. If I understand correctly, the way you dock a city bike is you roll it out backwards and you're rolling it out onto the street where it, into a car that's turning fast onto turning onto your right. So you'll be revert, you'll be walking backwards, not available, not aware there could be a car turning behind you and the car turning right, they, that spike is going to be in their blind spot. Yes. So we can take another look at this location. You said Beverly and Westminster is the intersection that is of concern here. Yes. Yeah, and I would say that there's, you know, we do have some buffer, like stations are designed in mind to like, you know, make sure that folks have like a little bit of wiggle room. Um, so the station envelope, um, the way that the equipment is designed is so that you can um, reverse, you know, obviously folks uh, most likely if they're going to be pulling out a bike, you know, going to be looking behind them, you know, before they do, obviously, like we're human, sometimes we don't think, um, you know, what I would say also about city bike stations is that they're at a lower profile. And so what we do find is that at intersections, um, it creates like clearer sight lines so cars can see people um, a lot easier. Um, so this creates like what we call like a daylighting situation. It just makes the in intersection and people walking into the intersection um, more visible. Um, so this enhances safety at any intersection um, that we put it in. Um, and then just kind of talking about a little bit of the density along Beverly Road. Um, so we really want to make sure that we have a very dense network where wherever we're going, we want people to be a three to five minute walk, no matter where they are in the service area. That means like where you're coming from and where you're going. So we put these in residential communities. We put them in commercial corridors to make sure that you can get you know, you can walk out your front door in three minutes to five minutes, you're at a bike share station. Um, and then wherever your destination is, you're no more than a three to five minute walk. It makes the system really convenient um, and easy to use. It's, you know, core principle in why this program is so successful in New York City. Um, and so Beverly Road, the reason we have two um, kind of along where you actually have the, the subway station, Beverly Road itself, where the actual access to the subway station, we couldn't find any viable options like right off of where that entrance was. So we have one on Rugby um, and we also have one on 17th that are going to provide a little bit of access to it. Um, but I also understand like Westminster, just a little bit off of Beverly. I think you can kind of see how the road, the way that the road is, um, it sort of those blocks become wider. Um, we just want to make sure that we have like an even spread um, for folks if they want to go north or south, whichever direction they're going, they can walk to a station that's closer there. So we just want to make it super convenient. That way people actually use the system um, there. So just kind of wanted to talk through a couple of those points. Um, if I'm missing anything that you mentioned, let me yeah, know. So th thank you, Lisa. Yeah, so I suppose the question was, you know, why would we have, if that's the case, why would we have two city bike locations so close together? If it is to, uh, you know, allow the, a greater number of people to get access to bikes, why are there no sites on the other side or closer on the other side of the Beverly Road subway station, the MTA station, which is at, towards further up along Beverly Road? I I, for, I, I didn't see it on the, the, the diagram there that, um, Miss Malloy show, showed at the beginning of the presentation. There was no sites there. Um, and also, to your point, if it's going to be near, you know, bike lanes, what, what there's no bike lane selected on, or there's no bike lane on Westminster Road. There is one on Beverly. Okay. Of course, we try to like complement the existing infrastructure. Um, but any any road is legal for any you know cyclist to ride down. Right. Um, and people live along Westminster, um, people are trying to get to different portions of, you know, Beverly. So we just want to make sure that there's just sort of an even spread. We just cast like a really tight net um, of stations across the service area. Um, that way it ensures people have like redundancy, reliability. Let's say, you know, in the end of the evening, one of the con major concerns that we heard the last time we came to this community was that a lot of the stations, um, you know, along the park, they get full in the evening because people are coming home, trying to get home. Um, and so some of the worry was that there wouldn't be enough docking, you know, places to dock a bike. 
Um, so we really want to make sure we pepper corridors where we know people are traveling to and from. Um, and so what we really want to do is complement what we say complement the in existing infrastructures because you want to make sure you have first and last mile, right? So want to make sure that like there's a station, um, you know, close to close to a subway, which this one is is sort of. So let's say that like. You know, both of the one on rugby and the one on E17 are full. It's not that far of a distance, depending on where you're going along Beverly. Um, so really just trying to reinforce the network here. And um, also wanted to just kind of highlight, I know you made a comment about like the station size. Happy to kind of review and talk through that um, a little bit with you, but the stations around this, uh, you know, neighborhood are going to be smaller. Um, we're talking about like 19, you know, 19 docks, two and a half. Parking spaces ish, so it's, they're not going to be huge stations. They're not going to be, you know, something that's going to be uh, what you'd see in like, you know, the core of Midtown Manhattan um, per se. So these are reflective of, you know, the neighborhood. We just want to make sure folks, you know, when they're when they're leaving to work, they have an extra option, um, and when they're coming home, um, they have a place to dock. Okay, so can I just ask, I know in the interest of time. Um, if there's anything that needs to be followed up on, if we don't have time for, because there are several other people in line, and I do defer to the co-chairs as to whether you want to wrap this up or, or move on, but I just want to offer that the community board will be helpful in following up on anything that doesn't get answered here and now. Okay, and should we use that email address that was put in the chat, bike share at uh, dot.nyc.gov to... Because I have still a number of questions from the other residents. I'll, I'll, I'll put the community read, board e email in the chat. Yeah, thank that you very email much. would be good. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time. Um, just in the interest of time, we do have four more members of the public that I think we just wanted to get through, and then Sean, you can address your question. Um, Glenn, I do see your hand. Um, I just think we should just um, just have this conversation now and then move on. Um, so, just Joshua Tyberg, you're welcome to speak next. Yeah, thank you. Um, I recently became a city bike member. Uh, it's absolutely terrific. Uh, I use it in downtown Brooklyn, and so I'll definitely su support expanding it uh, south of Cortelio. However, I don't see myself using it over here unless they are protected bike lanes. And so my question is, to what extent uh, is the DOT considering, you know, taking existing lanes, turning them into protected bike lanes, but even newer, uh, uh, any plans that are going to be a protected? I think, that, I think that's the, the second part of this meeting. So let, let's let's save that question for the, the second part, because this is about city bikes. All right, can we move on to the next question? Uh, Nathan Thompson is next. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Can you hear me? Am I unmuted? Okay. Hey, um, I actually just threw the bulk of my statement into the chat because I know that you guys were very short on time. So I would just add that we were caught by surprise. I'm vice president of the, the Prospect Park South Board Association. Esther came to speak, but she ran out of time. She would have changed her plans if we had understood this was all happening earlier. And we're really sorry we're not prepared more. We did bounce this off our 206 member Google group and got almost like 50 responses. It was a very passionate day and with a huge range of responses. Um, our short urge is that you give us some time to respond and don't move forward with the rugby road ones in this lower density area until we've had a chance to to assess it in a, in a bigger way. Um, I would I would definitely put out there that none of the responses were down on city bike. In fact, most people agree. I live on just off Church Avenue on Buckingham, so I'm a block from Caton where there are two city bike, um, and it's not enough. I get it. Um, we we use city bike, and even though most of the houses here do have garages and do have our own bikes, I like my own bike, but my wife and my son both like their own. I like to use city bike. If you go at nine in the morning, they're gone. And if you come back after 10 at night, they're full. And as a result of that, you're looking for a place to put them. So nobody is in, in my sense was saying we should not be doing this at all. Our questions were really about the, the placement. 
If you want to be near Church Avenue train station, let's put one there. If um, I'm glad to see that there's more urge. Uh, in fact, that looked like an updated map. I hadn't seen how many were going up along Cortelia because I do think that they're crying for it. But people are coming from farther from Dorchester um, and then and walking a long way. <clears throat> Finally, I would just mention that uh, Beverly Road Station is really one block from Cortelia. Those are that's a very tight time and <laughs> the history of that's kind of comical, but um, you're pretty close to Beverly Road Station if you've got a if you've got a station at Cortelia. I I put the uh, in the chat the rest because I I understand we're short on time. Thank you for listening. And Nathan, what is you want to just share your feedback through the bike share inbox? That would be the best way to start a start the dialogue. Next, we have Alana W. Hi, thank you. Um, this is really exciting. I'm a city bike rider and wanted to just um, reiterate the things I did put in the chat. One is that the configuration at Caton and Argyle. Um, I hope that's what's being considered everywhere. It, it avoids some of those issues of backing into the traffic because it's now spaced wide enough with the angle parking that you can just pull straight through. Um, so that was a really wonderful change at that station. Um, maybe other places too, but that's where I mostly come and go from. Um, the other thing is that looking at the map as a city bike user, this the density seems about as low as you could possibly go given the um, just the issue of having to find an alternative dock often, like when the one dock is full and you can't um, park there or if a dock is empty and you can't find a bike. So um, I think on every block along rugby, as somebody who lives on rugby, like that makes sense. I, I think it's actually, um, as we see how this plays out and what the demand is, um, I'm hopeful that the density of, net, of stations here will actually increase over time as we see the benefit to our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, next, we have Murray Lantner. Hey everyone, thank you. I'm excited that the that the network is moving south to Cortelio. I I welcomed my daughter back from Caton Avenue today, where we have a dock that's the closest bike rack. Um, so I'm very excited. I live down on Avenue H in Argyle. I would love to see one, and I think there's a lot of room at Newkirk Plaza, and that might be an awesome place to put a, a bike rack. Um, I know the network's not there yet, but I would love to see it expanding south because maybe you'd get around some of these um, street issues because it's it's this plaza that probably does have some space. Um, so yeah, I would love to see the network expand even further south if possible. So I, I'm excited that it's coming to Cortelli Road. I'm really happy and I hope you can work out these different concerns, but I am very excited that it is coming further south. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're still working through, as I mentioned, you know, this is phase three and we're still working through to find out if we'll be able to plan through a phase four and what that would look like in the future. So it's good to hear that people in the community would like to see it continue to expand. Oh, yeah. And Newkirk Plaza, it's a little, you know, a little further south of Cortelli, but I think there might be, would be a well used and, and it's probably off street space that could be used, could be amazing. Thank you. Um, I have a question from the, in the chat from a community board member. So uh, will DOT relocate the stations if after say six months, they realize that uh, they are not uh, are utilized or underutilized rather? I think for us, six months is a little like too short of a time frame um, to like really analyze like certain data, but we certainly, um, you know, look at station usage. We you know, can shift things um, depending on like needs. So certainly always open to have a conversation um, with folks um, if they're noticing particular patterns. Thank you for that. And Glenn, I see your hand and uh, to wrap us uh, up, Sean will have the last word. Thank you very much. I just like to start by saying I, I love the idea of city bike. Uh, my wife and I are bike riders, but our bikes are in the garage. Uh, but I do take exception to the fact that you've said on a couple of occasions that you're following the specific playbook uh, that has worked for you. Well, in the past, you were operating in high and medium density neighborhoods almost exclusively. You're now moving into medium and low density neighborhoods, and it's time for you to revise your playbook to suit the new situations you're moving into. 
And that's all I have to say about it, because I'm not going to go into specifically what that means, but it does mean that you need to rethink some of these locations in this low density neighborhood. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Um, and, you know, more generally, what I'd say is like, we don't have a one size fits all sort of solution. Um, you know, higher density neighborhoods get bigger stations, you know, places that are high trip generators get larger stations. These are going to be our smallest stations um, that we'd be installing here. Um, so certainly not, we try to fit it to the fabric of the neighborhood, but, you know, network density is among our chief principles here. Um, thanks. Sean, you want to bring us home? No, I think we we can wrap up and move on to the second section of the uh, the agenda. Although I guess I will, since I'm unmuted, um, uh, thank Mr. Brown for clearing the catch basins. More residents like you, please. All right. Uh, great. Thank you. Um, so, so I just wanted to, so I guess let's move on to the bike lane network proposal. And I believe uh, Lauren from DOT is presenting that. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, uh, let's go with that. And uh, we'll take questions afterwards. And uh, I guess if uh, Councilman uh, Yeager's uh, still still here, he could start us off after the presentation. All right, thank you. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and then. Um, and then we can begin. Okay. Sorry, hold up. My computer just had one little issue. Okay. Okay, everybody can see my screen now. No, we Actually, just we could and now we can't. Hmm. Okay. There. Once more. There it is. All right. Uh, computers never get old. Um all right. Well, good evening. Um my name is Lauren. I am from uh DOT and we will be going over some bike network expansion for community board 14. Just some quick um, background of kind of how this presentation is set. We'll start out with some background about the safety and the community outreach. Um, but we also want to go over some parade ground improvements uh, that are um, kind of on their own. And then we will go into the 2023 bike network proposal, which is really um, updated from what we have presented to the board in the past. Then we can go into some uh, discussion about potential protected bike lanes, and then we'll sum it all up. So um, just so you know what's, what's coming, because there's a few topics. Uh, so real quick, going through some background. Community Board 14 is in a priority bicycle district. This means there's a high ratio of crashes and low um, amount of bike infrastructure. Um, so there have been, you know, 38 cyclists uh, killed or severely injured in a five year period within the, the district itself. And um, unfortunately, as recently as October of 22, we had a cyclist fatality um, within the district as well. And as I said, we have uh, been here before. Uh, we did come back in 2021 with this plan that is on um, the screen. And we did gather a lot of feedback from that meeting as well as some other outreach since then. And so we are coming back to you tonight with our updated plan. Uh, and we did try to get as much outreach as possible. As you can see, we did an online survey. It was part of a larger multi um, multi community board outreach, but it included the entirety of CB 14 and um, helped with a lot of routes, but also location specific things such as um, around the parade grounds. And that's where we will get into some of that. 
Um, but we also didn't just do things online. We were also out in person in the summer of 2021 and 22. Um, you know, places like Newkirk Plaza, places like Parkside and Ocean. Um, and we we were able to get um, more responses as recently as last month to our survey. And then, as many of you know, we uh, had our protected bike lane installed in 2021 on Parkside Avenue. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're excited about how this project went and have also gathered a lot of feedback about how people would like to um, better access to it. So that brings us to the first uh, part of our planned proposal that we'd like to go over, which is um, situated around the parade ground and improvements accessing both to the parade grounds, but also through it. So I'll go through um, the improvements getting to the parade grounds first. So in the existing field conditions today, you have the two main paths through the parade ground, north, south, and east, west. While it is signalized at Caton and Argyle, um, there is uh, no signal following it if you go to the north and try to access Parkside Avenue's two-way bike path. Um, there's also missing crossings along Parade Place, um, specifically at the path, but also there is a playground um, directly across from Crook Ave as well. So lots of people crossing, but no actual marked crosswalks. So we're planning to fix all of those things, one by installing a mid-block signal on Parkside Avenue um, at the big entrance to the parade grounds. This would be very similar to what you're seeing at the bottom, which is Prospect Park West at 9th Street, um, a little bit of an iteration of that. What we would be looking to do on Parade Place is add what we call an enhanced crossing um, at Crook Ave, and that is where we put signs, stop bars, and crosswalks so that cars know where to stop when pedestrians are in um, the roadway. And then uh, even though there's already crossings at Argyle Road, we would like to upgrade the ramps and uh, make it better for pedestrians and cyclists using that signalized intersection. And then just a bit more detail about the proposed um, signal on Parkside. It would be slightly different than than what was at 9th Street on Prospect Park West, but it would still have two crosswalks and then just the one crossing for the uh, protected bike lane. Now talking about getting through the parade grounds, uh, there is the obvious gap in the network uh, here for cyclists. A lot of people trying to get to Parkside Avenue from the south, they take Argyle and Rugby and they cut through the parade grounds to get there, but there's um, not clear wayfinding or uh, also, you know, you have the one path um, close to Stratford that is mapped, but can't really see it in um, the field conditions. So we're working with, uh, Parks and the Prospect Park Alliance to kind of come up with some potential design solutions in order to um, properly route cyclists and, and improve the shared pedestrian cycling space through the park uh, so that we can keep cyclists safe going where they're going, um, as opposed to trying to get them to cycle on Caton. Uh, Okay, so that stuff was all new. Now going to the update of the uh, bike network proposal. And so this is the community um, district wide proposal. And just a quick reminder that we have our normal toolbox of shared bicycle lanes, standard bicycle lanes, and protected bicycle lanes. Um, this proposal focuses on shared and standard bicycle lanes um, at this time. We will discuss later some protected bicycle lane um, ideas, but just wanna make sure that it's clear the network proposal tonight is standard and shared lanes specifically. So in the existing bike network, um, you can see here, there's quite a gap south of Avenue H, um, but also kind of a lack of connection east to west 
Um, and so we have updated our proposed network uh, for reference. I've put the 2021 proposal up in the corner, um, but we have a, a network. So hold up. Okay, sorry about that. Quick uh, interruption by the fire alarm. Okay. Um, sorry, so continuing, I, I hope you guys couldn't hear the fire alarm, but um, so we have updated the East 13th Street, East 12th Street, and East 17th and 18th, um, as opposed to before it was 14, 15, 17, and 18, I believe. Um, and we have updated those more due to street width, con uh, continuity, and then connecting to um, both the existing and future network expansions. Um, and so kind of what this is going to end up looking like on the street level for your one way streets that are 30 to 33 feet wide. Um, it's just going to be the lane markings for the bikes. All parking stays the same. All traffic flow stays the same. Um, and it just adds a space for the cyclists. Uh, for things that are a bit wider, you have the two way streets that are 42 to 44. These include Cortelu, Foster, Farragut, um, and the list goes on. These lanes will be one direction bike lanes on one side of the street. And in order to, you know, balance it out, each one of these has a pair. So Cortelu would have been paired with Dorchester, which is already one way, Foster's with Farragut, um, IJ, and LM. And this allows it so that we have um, no parking loss and no travel lane removal, and we still are able to fill in those those gaps in the network. Okay, and so that is everything that we have planned for 2023. Um, but that is not the end of the conversation. We uh, wanted to take this opportunity to start to to talk to the community about potential protected lanes. Um, we know they have benefits. We know they are great for safety. They calm traffic. They shorten crossing distances. They make it comfortable for, um, you know, different comfortability of bike users. Um, but we also know that these take up space and they come with trade-offs and they come with a lot of studying to be done. So we wanted to come to the community and kind of start to to talk about these different options and how we look at it in your neighborhood. So looking at kind of potential things, um, like we said, there would be things that are trade-offs um, as opposed to where the conventional lanes, we can install those without any changes to travel or parking. Uh, this requires more time to study it, to see if it's feasible. Um, if we have to convert something to a one-way street, that's something that then we need to study. And so before we take all of our time and resources into doing that, we wanted to um, touch base with you guys and see your thoughts. So we would like to kind of just quickly go through, we have, um, identified Dorchester and Ditmas Avenue and 18th Ave as possible things to study uh, from Flatbush Ave to Coney Island and then Ocean Parkway to Flatbush. Um, for streets like Dorchester Road, it's a much easier lift because it's already one direction. We're planning it in the 2023 um, conventional bike lanes and to make it a protected bike lane, we could still keep all the parking. Um, the only difference would be that when we do a protected bike lane, we do um, remove some parking at the intersections for daylighting. Usually that's one to two spots where you can make the corners more visible um, as discussed in the um, bike share presentation. So it does help with that, but we do lose um, one to two spots per block. Um, so while that's easy, 
Ditmas Ave and 18th Ave is also 33 feet wide, just like Dorchester, but it's a two way. And so to try to make this a protected bike lane, we would look at something like converting it to a one way street. Um, in order to fit the space in, and we'd still have that parking loss at corners, um, but that would require converting uh, one way eastbound. So all of the westbound traffic would have to be taken off of 18th Ave, um, and that does include rerouting a bus. So those are our big lifts that we would have to study and look into and see if it's even feasible. Um, but we also, could alternatively look at doing something like keeping the traffic capacity two way, um, but then removing all the parking. So, you know, it's it's either one is going to be um, a huge trade off for these protected lanes, and we wanted to uh, really bring that conversation to you guys before we go diving into uh, all of the different things that we would have to do in order to achieve some of these protected bike lanes um, and see what what would be um, the priorities for for trade-offs um, so just real real quick to go over all of that um, for next steps we will be uh, looking to install the crossings on parade place and the signal at parkside um, hoping for this fall starting in the signal hoping in the fall and starting everything else in the summer if we can um same with the conventional bike network and expansion that would start this year and then obviously continue into next year it's the whole network um, and then we want to return to you with actual protected bike lane proposals um, but we obviously want to get your feedback on that first um, and some of your thoughts so um yeah so any questions uh myself and my um colleague nick will be happy to uh answer thank you very much for that uh appreciate uh you coming by and, and giving that presentation uh looks like we definitely have some questions um so as discussed uh council member jaeger if you're still here and uh want to uh ask a question or raise anything uh go for it I am, but but I see the district manager has her hand up and, and some of the uh, members of the board and neighbors who are here. So I'd like to hear from them first before I speak, if that's okay. That's fine. Uh, that's Sean, do you want to kick us off then? I just have questions about the parade ground. Um, the, if bike lanes, I, I assume Parks has signed off on this as a, as a proposal. The, the, will the rules where the, park closes the parade ground closes at 10 will the ridership then have to circumnavigate the park or the parade ground once it closes number one number two who will then be who will maintain those lanes um would it still be a park's maintenance on the road or would dot maintain the road and would dot anticipate adding l additional lighting on those otherwise dark paths um um if they in, in, you know to complement the bike lane Hi, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Nick Carey. I can help answer some of these questions. Uh, so we're still working with parks and how it's the design is going to work out within uh, the park. Uh, there's already a lot of cyclists using it. We see it all the time and so do they. Um, we're working out ways to make sure that pedestrians are still safe and that cyclists don't go too quick. Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to wrap my head around all the questions. One of them was um, who will maintain it? Uh, um, uh, parks will maintain it. Uh, we won't be adding lighting as part of this project and we won't be changing any of the uh hours of when the park is open as part of this project that wasn't my question oh. um and i was and i was focused on the parade ground specifically not prospect park i'm sorry i'm sorry i meant the parade grounds yeah the, okay the... i'll follow up offline okay okay uh glenn woolen you have your hand up Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> at one point, we're considering running uh, north on Stratford to get over and then maybe one block further to get over to the driveway through the parade grounds. And has that been dropped altogether? And uh, one other thought, if you're gonna consider making Ditmas Avenue one way, um, 
<clears throat> I, I think that's going to be a little bit rough, but that's going to throw a lot of traffic onto Dorchester. So you'd have to consider getting rid of all those stop signs and put in time traffic lights so that could move. But whatever you do, you'd have to minimize the loss of parking. Uh, parking is kind of tough around there. Um, so, you know, that, that's it. Minimize the loss of parking. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. And yeah, no, I can I can just say as far as the um, Ditmas 18th Ave stuff, none of that is planned right now. Um, and we are very aware that converting it to one way would have huge um, traffic implications because that traffic would have to go somewhere. And so that's why we wanted to kind of come to you guys first before we go um, into that study, because that is something that that would take a lot of um, time and resources and energy to see if that is feasible. Um, and then as for the Stratford path, that is, we are still looking to have cyclists go through there. Um, but if they're coming up Argyle and Rugby, um, we don't want to have to have people cycle on Caton with the trucks. Um, so if they are just going to Parkside Ave, um, they do, as of today, cycle through the parade grounds on the other path as well. So um, both would be would be kept. Okay, what I was suggesting is that you might open up a, a shared lane on Abermarl to bring people over to Stratford so they're closer to the other entrance, the, the driveway through the parade grounds. That's an interesting idea, um, and we're happy to we're happy to consider it. And if you know if it's something we can, we'll try to we'll take notes. And but if you know if this gets included in the minutes somehow, that'd be great. Um, we won't be adding it as part of the scope that we're in, trying to install this year, next year. But we're certainly open to it in future. Thanks, Glenn. Um, Liz Denny's, uh, you're next. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I first just wanted to note that I really appreciate DOT continuing to come back on this. Um, you know, we have been waiting since initially identified as a dangerous area for cyclists in 2017 and pedestrians um, to get some improvements that would keep um, everyone on the road safer, make it clearer for everyone, but especially for those vulnerable road users of pedestrians and cyclists. Um, and, you know, I also want to note that people bike on every street here. Um, and so it's a really an issue of make to me, it's not just about making network, but making sure that all the streets that people have to bike on, which is every street in the area has like the right amount of interventions to make it very safe. Um, to that end, I'm really excited to see these changes to the parade ground. Um, I think it makes it a lot clearer and easier for people. I really wonder if Kayla Santiago, a mother of two children who lost her life at 25 to a truck hitting her on Parkside might not have died if this was a clear connection into that protected lane. Um, you know, I, I bike every day um, and I know a lot of people who bike every day, including with kids. And I want to note that I really appreciate your considering protected lanes, especially on that east west crossing there. I know I hear from so many people that that's such an essential route that they don't have an option for um, and that they do it anyway, because it's the best way for them to get there. There maybe aren't good bus connections or good subway connections to get from their area kind of on the eastern side of our district to a school on the western side or something like that. Um, so really hope that those proposals can get studied and implemented so, um, as soon as possible so that there aren't more deaths in our area or serious injuries. Um, one thing I want to note about, you know, when I talk about a lot of the, the streets, you know, some of them are more dangerous than others. There's two kind of really glaring um, streets that aren't included in anything on this. And I know one of them's challenging because it's on the border of city council and community board districts. Um, but Coney Island Avenue is repeatedly brought up as something where people you know, can't cross safely, needs a lot more daylighting. Um, and there are delivery cycles going up and down that road all the time. There's a lot of businesses there. So I even see, I see a lot of, nor, you know, non-delivery, like non-professional cyclists is what I want to say, um, biking parts of that. And it's, it's harrowing to watch that. Um, and Ocean Avenue also is just difficult because there's buses and there's a painted bike lane that's almost always blocked many, many cars in a row. So, you know, maybe seeing a complete street that helps with that um, there would help make it safer for everyone. Um, I just want to note, I also hear a lot from people who never, ever bike and just want a lot of that daylighting and protected uh, uh, that uh, that would come with protected bike lanes so that cars can see them um, on Dorchester. No one follows the stop signs right now. There's a few stop signs, in my opinion, that are missing that people really just go 50 miles an hour sometimes um, down um, the road. It seems, you know, I've been out there with a speed gun um, and 
that's, you know, they can't see people who are crossing the street. They can't see families getting across the street. Um, so I just you know, really want to thank you for that and really want to encourage those studies because I think it's really, really important. Thank you. And I'll just say briefly that as hard as Ditmas and Dorchester look in those slides Lauren presented um, with such big trade offs, we looked at all the streets in the in the whole community district and the other ones seem even tougher to us in terms of the trade offs. Um, but that doesn't mean that they can't be done. You know, we just want to have a you know, honest conversation about what those trade offs are. Um, but thank you for your support. Uh, Mehdi, I think you're the next board member who's up. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate the presentation and I, I remember that your uh, the first draft that you presented a while ago and um, I think this is an improvement. Um, I live on Dorchester and I can tell you that there's a lot of space uh, for a protected bike lane and we see so many parents every morning biking their kids um, on this street and um, uh, I, I would say uh, just have a bike, having a bike lane is probably not enough. We really need a protected bike lane. Um, even if we can protect it by parking, that would be great. Um, and I understand that so many he, so many of us here come from different perspectives, community board members, general public, they come from um, uh, different um, approaches of um, about bike lanes and parking space. Um, I don't want to have a an, a conversation about what is right or wrong objectively. I, th I, I take it as a subjective uh, matter, although I think there is an objective point to make. Um, but if but if it is subjective, uh, I would like to say parking space is um, is not something that everyone can use. Parking space is something that one person uses. So many person cannot. And bike lane is something that so many people need and the safety and their life is depending on that. Um, so I would be OK to see more parking spaces are gone um, for the sake of safety of biking. And that's my perspective. I understand that so many people don't share it, um, but as a as a board member, I totally support um, um, having more bike lanes if we even have less parking space. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for those comments. Uh, Musa, you, it looks like you're the next board member who has their hand up. Go for it. Thank you very much. I also want to thank the DOT for the presentation. Um, first, I just want to say I'm really happy and I'm really excited about the upgrade to the parade grounds. I, I go through there every day and I take most of the bike lanes in, in the district um, uh, pretty much every single day uh, to get to, uh, back and forth from work. And um, the improvements that you guys are proposing are are, gonna, are very meaningful to me and many other people who ride those bike lanes. So I really appreciate that. Um, I'm also really encouraged by the east-west connections. I think those are really great. Um, and any opportunity that we can take to protect those lanes would be uh, I would I would fully support. Um, as someone who rides regularly in the neighborhood, who didn't just a few years ago. Um, it's become a great way for me to get around to access the neighborhood in a new way that I didn't previously, um, especially when the train or the buses aren't working properly. Um, the one question I had um, is I didn't see in the proposal any extension, even just paint, uh, like a standard um, bike lane down Ocean Avenue. Maybe I missed the point. Um, but I didn't, I know a good portion of it in the district does have. Uh, a protected bike lane. I ride it often. Uh, sorry, a a standard bike lane. Um, and I just noticed that in this one, it, it didn't keep going south, but it seemed like that would make sense to me. I have ridden down there um, towards the southern portion of the district, and it's kind of crazy to ride there without any paint at all. Um, so I was hoping to understand whether you'd be open to um, extending it. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, we would be open to extending Ocean. Um, the challenge with Ocean is that it's if I remember this correctly, it's 50 feet wide south of Prospect Park. Um, and with one lane in each direction, there's just enough room for a conventional bike lane in each direction. But when you go south of, I want to say Farragut, it widens out to 70 feet. It's got two lanes per direction, plus the center turn lane um, and a lot of traffic volume on it. Um, there is, you know, a way we, you know, where we could, um, we could 
uh, take some of the space used in the center flush median and have a conventional bike lane for the bulk of the block and then have it kind of go down to Sharrow's uh, at the end of the block where we need space for the turn lane. Um, but uh, it wasn't, we weren't planning to do it as part of this, but you know, if you guys, if you're interested and, um, and request it, we're, we're happy to consider it in the near future. I am definitely interested in requesting it. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, Councilman Ye uh, Yeager, I'll throw it back to you if you want to uh, speak uh, before, now that we're done with uh, Sean and the board members. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, you know, I, I, we've been down this road before, uh, no pun intended, and at the, at the starting point where a bike lane is installed that isn't a protected bike lane, it's a dangerous bike lane. Um, pretending otherwise is foolish uh, and I think short-sighted. Trying to force a, a bike lane onto Avenues M, Avenue J is dangerous. There is no other way of looking at it. You can say, well, you know, if everybody just drives at one mile an hour, everybody's going to be safe. But you have to match reality with what it is that is planned. Avenue M, Avenue J are incredibly congested. There is no block that doesn't have a double parker on it, a double park truck um, at any given moment. And the city hasn't made any effort to remove that. It, the, the DOT puts its hands in the air and says, well, go call the cops. That's not our problem. And that's not in Sean. I see you're, you're nodding your head because we've had this conversation a thousand times. Uh, um, that's not the solution. The solution isn't let's put it there and then let it be figured out later how the enforcement takes place. The solution is let the enforcement be there. And once it's safe, put the bike lane there. Without that, it's simply not safe. 12th, 13th, 17th, 18th, the only wide street in that list is East 17th Street. Every other street, 18th, 12th, and 13th, are very narrow. Some of them have schools on them. 12th, 13th uh, certainly does. Those schools have double parked school buses there in the morning, usually starting from 7 a.m. for several hours in the afternoon, usually starting from 2, 2 p.m. for several hours. They become dangerous by that nature. And I'm not excusing a, a car driver who quickly merges over to one side or the other to get through a double parked car and doesn't pay attention and then takes out a guy on a bike. But that if that happens, that's irresponsible government. Regardless of whether or not the driver paid attention and did the right thing or the wrong thing, we recognize drivers sometimes do, don't always do the right thing. But our job as government, I would assume that the job of the DOT is to protect people from getting hit by a car, even if they're on a bike. And that doesn't seem to be what this plan does. What this plan seems to do is say, we're going to draw the paint and uh, we're going to just close our eyes and hope for the best. And it's just not realistic. It's not, it's not wise. It's incredibly dangerous. We've seen this happen before. We had these conversations in a different community board about 13th Avenue. The same conversation. If a street can't handle a bike lane, you don't try to shoehorn it in. It's not fair to bikers. It's not fair to pedestrians. It's not fair to the city. And it's silly just to try to meet a metrics of let's check a couple of boxes and get a couple of more miles of bike lanes up. We're going to do it over here. We've been talking about, I heard the, the questions about Ocean Avenue. There are places on Ocean Avenue where you can do them reasonably. There are places on Ocean Avenue where it's incredibly dangerous. If you try to link the network by using Ocean Avenue without paying attention that there's a difference between the safe part of Ocean and the dangerous part of Ocean, you're going to hurt people. So I, I urge you, before you start putting paint down and putting people's lives in jeopardy, go back to the drawing board find out whether or not this makes sense in a very real way. And if it doesn't, don't force by, bike lanes on the streets that can't handle them, put them on streets that can handle them. Bedford Avenue was a perfect example of a calm street that can handle the bike lanes safely. And it, it, I have recognized that Bedford being East 25th Street till East you know, 12th, 13th, 17th and 18th is not very close, but when you're on a bike, it's also not very far. So that's all for now, but I did want to hear from the neighbors uh, before I said this. I'm not saying anything different than DOT has heard me say for a very long time about this. Um, uh, and I, I recognize uh, uh, there are people here who may not know who I am because you're not in my district. Um, uh, my district uh, extends to, for the most part, the south of Avenue I, but I served on this community board for 18 years before I ran for the city council. 
I know every part of Community Board 14 like the back of my hand, and I see Chairman Burke is here, and he knows that I know this neighborhood. Um, and Sean Campbell is the third district manager that I've worked with, and she's fabulous. This this is a community district that I love. I care very much about even the parts that aren't in my district, and I don't want to do dangerous things anywhere, even the parts that aren't in my council district. So leave it at that for now. I hope that we're going to have more conversations about this, um, and that's it. I appreciate you chairs for giving me uh, the extra time, and thank you very much for holding this meeting and going into the dark of night with it. Thank you, council member. Um, does DOT have any comment or should we move yeah. on to the next question? Thank you for that council member. I'll just briefly say that we've installed similar bike lanes on streets on narrow streets, like 12th and 13th and 17th and 18th. Uh, we've installed bike lanes on streets with schools on them, uh, on commercial streets. And what we've seen on average over time is that even conventional bike lanes. Uh, bike lanes not physically separated from traffic by a vertical element. Even conventional bike lanes do improve safety for cyclists and pedestrians because they have a traffic calming effect. Um, so, you know, this isn't the end all be all of uh, bike network design in this district, but uh, we think it's a good place to start and we're confident that these lanes will mostly work. I appreciate that, but but I would just and I'm not going to do it back and forth because it's not my meeting. I appreciate that very much. I know you're the experts on bike lanes. I'm the expert on my neighborhood, um, and there's there's a big difference. You you know the you know bike lanes, and that's great. But every neighborhood is different, and blocks are different. We are an incredibly congested neighborhood south of Avenue J, going from J to P. It is incredibly busy. There is a network of schools that each run their own separate school transportation. They don't rely on the city for transportation. That means that there are school buses all over the place in the morning that has our sanitation trucks and school buses competing for road space. It is incredibly dangerous, incredibly congested. And in fact, it's become so much that in one part of the neighborhood, not in this community district, we had to shift sanitation pickup to a weekend simply to accommodate the number of, of vehicles on the road during the weekday. So these are things that are, are deeply thought, and I would encourage you to talk to sanitation, talk to the police department about it, see what's going on in this neighborhood, and throwing down a counter on a block and saying, well, how many cars go by here on any given moment is not the same as knowing it with your eyes. And I, I, like I said, I don't want to do the back and forth, and I'm happy to have subsequent meetings and to continue talking about this, but the experience that you have on putting down bike lanes is not the experience that Sean and I and others have with the teens in the in uh, in the range of Avenue I to Avenue P. It's just not the experience we've seen. And we deal with this all the time. I speak to the district manager several times a week about stuff like this. So we'll leave it at that for now, but I, I am happy to continue talking. I would ask you that you'd not come down with a bucket of paint before we continue this conversation. All right, thank you, uh, thank you. Council Member. Um, the, uh, I guess uh, we'll move on to uh, hands uh, raised by community members. Um, there are several, um, and I, I do want to wrap. I, I, we do have uh, other business, and I did want to address one thing then. Um, so I'd, I'd like for the, this to go no longer than 20 minutes. So if everyone could keep their questions as brief as possible and only ask one question or make one comment, and uh, let's not have. Uh, back and forth so if we can avoid it, please. Uh, with that said, um, Ben, uh, if, if you wanted to go first, go ahead. Lauren, Nick, thank you for the presentation. Um, very supportive of adding to the bike network in this neighborhood. So thank you for the work doing here. Um, it sounds like this is not an either or where we have to choose between protected bike lanes in the future and some conventional lanes now. Uh, I am very supportive of additional protected lanes. Um, I think taking a look at Ocean, um, because the current lane is not respected, I know that enforcement doesn't lie with DOT, but I think that's really important. That's a super dangerous route to ride. So is Caden. Um, so supportive of the work you're doing, supportive of adding more bike protection, um, and to the, the points around um, adding conventional lanes being irresponsible. I think um, if people are already biking on a street, um, I bike on streets that don't have bike lanes right now because I don't have a choice. Um, I would much rather have a conventional bike lane. 
I would certainly prefer a protected lane. So anything we can do to get those in would be great. Thank you. Great, uh, thanks for that. Um, next, uh, Matt, do uh, you have a question? Uh, yeah, uh, I want to say thank you for presenting. I'm very excited about everything that was presented today and uh, the safety that it will add where people are already biking. Um, for the uh, protect the studying protected lanes, I just wanted to point out that I would hope that you are considering kind of east-west connections and continuing that protection outside of our district because we often, when you're on a bike, it's easy to go much further than the uh, the uh, width of the, uh, the of this district, and also to consider the adding a north-south protected route because it's a it's a long ways over to Ocean Parkway from the eastern end of uh, the of CD14. And the current uh, unprotected lands on Ocean Avenue and Bedford Avenue, especially in the northern part of the district, are just un basically unusable as a bike lane because they're completely double parked, but would seem to have a lot of space for or adding protected lands there. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. Uh, next, um, next, let's hear from Alana. Thank you. Um I want everybody to just pause for a moment. And if you're near a window, look out the window. What we are experiencing right now is the definition of a climate apocalypse. I, it's, I appreciate the, um, the plan that was presented. Um, I, I think if there are any of these corridors where it simply requires moving the parking over a little bit to create a protected lane between the parking and the curb um i i would plead with you please please do that i understand that there are situations like ditmas where there are those trade-offs but on rugby on argyle on dorchester on any of these other streets where you can simply reconfigure where the parked cars go to give us some protection in our neighborhood so people can ride without fearing for their lives? Please, please do that. As, as was mentioned earlier, Kayla Santiago was killed. We have pedestrians who've been killed in our neighborhood. Why, why are people dying on our streets when we can you know, make some of these simple changes without having to wait ye more years thank you i'll just say briefly that that was the goal you know looking through when we look through the streets is there anywhere we can do this where we minimize the impact um and aside from dorchester none of them are wide enough so there's streets like uh like argyle and rugby where we installed bike lanes back in 2015 i think and they just don't have the width the only way we could upgrade it to a protected bike lane is to remove parking from one side of the street, which again is something we're capable of doing. We just want to talk about it with you guys first. But thank you for your comment. Okay, thank you, uh, Jeff. You're up next. Hi. Um, I want to say thank you for the proposal overall. I specifically want to say thank you for all the work uh, proposed on the parade grounds. I think this is. I think the connection is badly needed. Uh, I mentioned this in the chat in the earlier part of the presentation. One worry I have is. I have seen cars run red lights there. I think they run red lights there because they're like, well, there's no cross vehicle traffic and I guess the other people trying to cross the street just don't matter. I don't know if there's anything you can do to dissuade speeding, dissuade, you know, passing, unsafe passing, et cetera, on Parkside uh, because I know some cars are just not going to respect that mm -hmm. stop. Um, but I do think overall, I think most, most cars are generally going to respect it. Uh, it will be a huge improvement. It'll be safer for people. Um, I do want to know what we can do or what you can do, I guess, to uh, bring up the timeline on the protected lanes. I think this proposal is a, an improvement, although it's very similar uh, to the one you came to this uh, committee with in fall of 2021. Uh, there's, I think, very much fewer shared lanes. Uh, and now there's sort of a plan, you know, a, some thinking about protected lanes. I think we really need the protected lanes to make this useful. Uh, I think we need the protected connections in both directions. Uh, I want to echo what I think Moose and some others said about Ocean Avenue, which is sort of regularly blocked with 
delivery civil parking center, and especially because there's that one block segment on ocean that's connecting up into, um, I think, Farragut, um, it would be really helpful if that could be addressed. So that's, that's essentially my comment um, is I would, uh, given how similar this is to 2021, I would like to know if we are closer to the protected lands. Uh, we're not any closer to the protected lands. Those are something we, we scoped really recently. I, I would say the earliest we could come back with uh, like a hardened proposal on that maybe maybe a year from now because really if we're if we were to convert Dipmiss and 18th Avenue to one way, we would be uh, pushing traffic onto Dorchester and onto Foster and we would need to study that and study what the impacts are um, and how we could potentially mitigate them um, and then you know coordinating with the MTA about uh, rerouting the bus between on on 18th Avenue between um, w west of uh, Coney Island Avenue would also be like a challenging conversation. You know, we would have to move bus stops. It would it would it would be a big uh, a big to do. Okay. So I would say maybe next year, but I don't want to I don't want to make any promises. But okay, um, but it, it sounds like sort of all the steps needed to get there are at least happening. So. Yeah, <laughs> so it's, a, it's a long process, but at least something's happening. So that that makes us say. Big improvement over 2021. Thank you. Yes, it is being looked at. Thanks for that. Uh, I see board member Florencia Chang Ajeda. You have your hand up. Good evening, everyone. So I'd like to say a couple of things. Um, as a, a driver and a pedestrian, because I do walk a lot. Um, I understand the plight of the cyclists. I have family members, I have friends who are cyclists. I also have family members who've been, uh, uh, my son's uh, girlfriend was knocked down by a cyclist. Um, and so there are two sides to everything. However, in listening to the conversations here, I don't hear uh, drivers parking being considered. And I think it's rather selfish to say, let's just take away parking uh, just to secure uh, cyclists. I think that cyclists also have to be careful. And as you know, as a driver, I'm also always looking out for pedestrians and cyclists and those on scooters as well. And so I would like to have some kind of consideration as one who lives in one of the streets that was mentioned to be considered for those of us who drive, you know, um, we can't go shopping or bring our family members to anywhere um, on our on our bicycles. So we do, some of us do need vehicles. Uh, I, I do take care of some elderly folks that don't ride bicycles. And so I, I'm not appreciating hearing that, oh, we'll just take by parking to ensure that uh, riders are secured. And, and I do, I, no lives being lost is ever a good thing, none. But as I said, and I've also almost been knocked over by cyclists while I was walking and walking on the sidewalk nonetheless. But I just wanna say that all of us have to consider each and every one we can't just think about one side of the story. Thank you. Thank you, Florencia. And we, we are taking into account the proposal from tonight does not remove parking. But as we said, we are looking at all of the options for the protected bike lanes and trying to see what works best. So none, none of the parking has been removed yet. Um, and that's why we wanted to bring it up with the community first. Uh, to just kind of discuss the the options and the trade off. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. There was a question in the chat about whether the current proposal removes any parking. So um, uh, that, that's that's helpful. Um, next uh, person uh, with their hand up is uh, Murray. Uh, feel free to uh, make hey, your address your question. Yeah. Hey, uh, uh, 12, 13, 17, 18. I, I disagree with Councilman Yeager. I think I, I bike some of those streets going south. I don't. When I bike, I don't necessarily like to go over to Bedford and then come back if I'm going down to Brighton Beach. Um, Argyle Road going north has a school on it. Yeah, there's traffic at drop off time. It is a little stressful, but I don't see that as a reason for not putting bike lanes on 12th, 13th, 17th, 18th. I think 
having those bike lanes are helpful for me as a cyclist, and I don't think they would impede traffic or cause a problem. So I disagree with the councilman. Where I do agree with him on Avenue J and Avenue M, I I I think is there a way to look at Avenue K and Avenue L? Or I mean, I'm kind of coming to this late, but J and M just seem like tough streets for me. They're tough streets for biking, and I and I think maybe K and L might be better east west routes than J and M. I just a thought, and I don't know if you have, if there's some reasons why you don't put it on K and L, but J and M seem like tough ones. I, oh, and one more thing on on the park side, Avenue Crossing, uh, I where where it's just a mid street, no intersection, putting a crosswalk there. I agree that some drivers are going to flake out and 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 not stop for whatever reason. I, and if there's a way to elevate that or have you know, so I've seen some crosswalks that are elevated. Some way to that's going to slow cars down. They're going to see it and not just go through it and potentially hit some kid on a bike crossing there. Thank you. Uh, I think you know for the for the red light running and the speeding. You know, I don't I don't have all the answers here about that, but I know that we can uh, potentially utilize speed cameras or red light cameras. Uh, but I, I can't really speak to the details on how that works. I know that's something DOT does, um, and. Uh, yeah, thank you for your comments about J and M. We'll, we'll look at, we'll look more at, at uh, K and L. Yeah, we can certainly look at K and L, but I also will say for Parkside, we are going to be um, building out a pedestrian island there to narrow the roadway, um, and to really make sure that that is clear visibility wise. Because um, yes, I, I've walked down Ocean and seen people blow through those red lights as well. So we are looking to. Um, do some traffic calming in order to um, account for that. Is there is there a way to raise the the crosswalk a little bit above the normal street grade that's going to have an impact of slowing traffic down and make it more visible? Is that one of the tools of the blue box or not really? Drainage here, it's tough. This this floods, um, as I'm sure many of you know. But we we will always investigate where we can. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, David, you're the last hand up if you want to uh, ask your question or make your comment. Hi, everyone. First, I just want to say thank you for being here and having the conversation. Um, I just want to first say, like, I, I, I think that the design is amazing. We need a bike network, but I also don't think that unprotected bike lanes really match the road conditions in this neighborhood for anybody who has ever biked here. Um, I do want to just focus on one thing that I think is missing in the network. I don't currently see an east-west connection on the area around Parkside Avenue. So something that connects the park entrance protected bike lanes to, let's say, the Bedford Avenue bike lane in the east. Um, that's a really, really dangerous part to bike. And there's no good connection to go. I don't know. Maybe there's an opportunity for something on Woodruff. Um, I know Parkside is crazy. Um, but that is just something I want to point out. You know, there's no alternative but to bike on the sidewalk there. Um, if anybody has ever been on Parkside and Ocean Avenue during rush hour, it's insane. Um, and there's also a new city bike dock on Parkside and Flatbush that is also very, very dangerous to take a bike out simply because cars speed. They uh, skip red lights. They turn at insane speeds. It's a little bit dangerous to be around there as a biker. Thank you. I live over there and I agree with everything you said completely. And yes, that does border uh, CB9. So um, that's part of the reason why it probably isn't looked at in this um, scope. All right. Well, uh, with that, I think um, I want to thank you, Lauren and Nick, for um, being on, making that presentation and answering all of our questions we really appreciate it and hearing hearing the community's comments sorry for the noise in the background um the uh and 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 i wanted to extend thanks to your uh colleagues that uh presented the first and the first half we really appreciate it um so th thanks for thanks for all that um the last item on our uh, agenda was other business and the one thing i can think of um that uh wanted to address was there was a meeting that i believe was um sponsored by uh yvette clark that i believe uh committee member 
Liz Denny's attended. Uh, so uh, Liz, if you wanted to uh, just tell us anything re uh, relevant transportation related that may have come up, just so we're we're in the loop, um, that would be appreciated. Yes, um, certainly. Um, the main focus on this meeting um, was about the Inflation Reduction Act and the uh, benefits that various people can get through that. Um, and in it, it mentioned both that there are some um, infrastructure projects that are going to be funded by that. It's not clear yet exactly what um, part of that will be going where in our neighborhood, um, but hopefully we can get some of that. Um, I believe some of Prospect Park is potentially using some of those grants to address some flooding issues that are infrastructure related on the roads that come out to other roads on our um, street as well, potentially. Um, but um, there, there was also discussion about um, an information about um, the electric vehicle um, discounts that you can get through um, the, the federal government. Um, and I believe I sent the info sheet that they handed out um, to you, Steve, that, and maybe also to Sean, but um, we can get that up on, on the website. To, it, it helps, it has a little bit more on how to navigate actually um, getting those if you're interested in purchasing an electric vehicle and um, you know, making sure that you are getting all of the discounts that you can um, in order to you know, help electrify um, cars in the area. Um, there were some other things about uh, housing improvements that people can have that are also in very well summarized in that handout. Um, I know that's not specifically transportation related, but just wanted to note that um, so that we can make sure that's up on the website and all the relevant spaces. Great, thank you. Uh, Josh, I saw you just put your, your hand up. Was it regarding uh, this, uh, that meeting? No, no, uh, just, just a general deal, deal to, uh, you know, issue that's not pertaining to Blake's. Um, can you, uh, send whatever, uh, comments to the board office or, or contact the board office after just cause I just want to stick with the agenda. We usually just don't open it up to general issues, uh, during transportation committee meetings. No, I mean, it is a transportation issue. It's just not pertaining to bikes. Uh, it's real quick. Uh, yeah, if you could direct your question uh, after the meeting to uh, the board office and, you know, if it's if it's something we can have a discussion at a future meeting about, uh, we will. Um, but I just want to, especially because, you know, it's we've been going almost two hours, so I just want to stick to the agenda here. Um, all right, thanks for that update, uh, Liz. Um, and yeah, we'll make sure to get the info regarding uh, the um, electric vehicles up on the uh, site. Ed, did you have anything else before we uh, close out? No, um, no, no new business here. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks for, uh, thanks everyone. Uh, I know it was a long meeting. Um, hopefully uh, everyone got a chance to ask their questions and comments for DOT regarding the, these, uh, the bike lanes and city bike. Um, and uh, I think both, both Ed and I had uh, <laughs> our own uh, childcare issues uh, tonight. So thanks for, uh, Thanks for dealing with us as we uh, tried to, uh, you know, navigate multiple issues, uh, getting us through this meeting. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, so um, thanks everyone. And uh, we have a board meeting coming up, what, next week? General board meeting? Yes, Monday in person, EMJC 1625 Ocean Avenue. See you all there. All right, thanks so much. Have a good night, everyone. Great meeting, thank you. <clears throat> good night. Thank you, good night, bye. Good night, Thank everyone. You all. Good night.